This is Ray Stokes, the curator of special collections in the library of the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. I believe this is August the 8th, isn't it? August the 8th, 1990, here in the studios of the Biomedical Communi uh, Communications Department. I'll get that out right. Today it's my pleasure to visit with a very dear friend of mine that I've known since about 1972. He was in practice at that particular time uh, in Dallas. That's when I first met him, and I followed his career ever since, and he joined the college here at TCOM in January 1974, so he was even here when we became a state institution in 75. I'd like to welcome and recognize my good friend, Professor Dr. Uh, John Herrickle of the Manipulative Department, a medicine department, and we're glad to have you here today to pick your brain, Dr. Uh, John. I'm going to call you Dr. John now as much as possible. So uh, we'd like to start by uh, letting you know that uh, you've had a great career in the osteopathic profession, and you're now the, well, I'm, I'm going to say what you are now. You are now, of course, you are a fellow in the Academy of Applied Osteopathy. You're also the president of the Sutherland, now the word Sutherland will mean something we'll refer to in a moment, the Sutherland uh, uh, Cranial Teaching Inst uh, Foundation. I'll get that out too, the Cranial Teaching Foundation. You're the president of that. So, and I'd like for you to, th to be thinking about these matters, and we'll touch on them in a minute. I'd like to have some sort of a, a what is the uh, connection, if any, between the, the Teaching Foundation and the uh, the uh, Academy of Applied Osteopathy, any relationship that there might be there. So, Dr. John, you got out of school in 1957 at Kirksville. Right. Tell me something about your experience at that time and how you came to Texas. Where, where did you grow up? And give me a little bit of biography of your, you, your youth and your early life. Started back in Pennsylvania, Ray. Pennsylvania. Uh, western part. Mm -hmm. Uh, small community, steel town, and uh, it was the goal of my mother that one of her kids was going to go to college, uh -huh. and they had just instituted a new law in Pennsylvania that if your grades were up to a certain level that you could go on to college the second semester of your senior year. Mm -hmm. So I had the privilege of being the first one in Pennsylvania to take care of that, at least in our area. Oh, is that right? and went to Grove City College to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. And about that time came the war. What war, specialty war. of engineering? I was thinking in terms of civil engineering. Civil engineer. Mm -hmm. And with the war came a lot of the young people decided that they would try to do their, their bit. And after I came back, things looked different and decided I really wanted to be a dentist. So I went to the University of Pittsburgh yeah. and made the first two to three cuts. We had something like 1,400 trying to get into 88 spots. 1,400? Hmm. And uh, My goodness. I imagine our, today our schools would like to have that kind of a pool to choose from. Mm -hmm. But after you made next to the last cut, then you had to demonstrate ability to pay. And so I had to change careers again and went into, decided I wanted to teach and graduated from Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Taught for part of a year in a part of Ohio in a consolidated school where we had kids from all walks of life. And I guess I realized then that there must be something else you could do as well. Yeah. And about that time, met my wife, and our then brother-in-law was an osteopath in Lima, Ohio, Dr. Was that your first introduction to osteopathy? I, my first introduction, Ray, was when I was helping paint the family home, and I reached a ladder over a fence, mm -hmm. and... It was a heavy old wooden ladder, and it started to go one way, so I jerked it, and I jerked it too hard, yeah. and I just couldn't breathe. Mm. And my friend of many years said, I go to an osteopath, and of course, I didn't know what that was. Right. So we went over to see his doctor. Now, and were you in, still in Pennsylvania at that time? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. mm. And uh, the man treated me, and 
the standard treatment of that time. And the next day I was back up on the ladder painting and I thought, gosh, that's great. In the meantime, uh, my friend had told Dr. Resnick of the grades I had in school and of my interest in dentistry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, he said, uh, if you were interested in dentistry, he said, you'll be interested in osteopathy. He didn't talk long, 10 or 15 minutes, but between what he said and the fact that I was back up on the ladder and one day said there must be something to it. So when we married, and my brother-in-law was a, a, if there is such a thing as a devout osteopath, uh, Dick Beery is a devout osteopath. You say and is in the present. He's still living then, is he? Yeah. Where is he practicing? He practices still in Lima, Ohio. Mm -hmm. and Lima, Ohio? Ohio. Mm -hmm. And has two sons who have graduated in osteopathy, both from Kirksville. Mm -hmm. So he said that uh, he would help Jane and I and if we could get into school. Well, at that time, Kirksville was the, the founding school. It still is. Yeah, right. And has always been a fine institution. And we mm -hmm. were blessed with being accepted. Yeah. And as sometimes the Lord works, uh, one chance in a million, my wife was a music teacher, and she would have to work if we mm -hmm. were going to get through school. Right. Uh, a job opened up. Mm. She interviewed the superintendent out in the pasture, because he was a farmer, and he accepted her yeah. on the spot, and then we were able to go ahead with the plans to get into Kirksville. I see. Graduated, as you've mentioned, there in 57. Mm -hmm. Where uh, did you do your internship? At the Kirksville College mm -hmm. Hospital. Yeah. What's the name of that? Uh, uh, it was then just the Kirksville oh, it was. Osteopathic they've, they've, Hospital. They've, they've dedicated it to some name now. In Laughlin or something? Laughlin is the one across the street. Oh, I see. There were I two see. two hospitals, I both see. osteopathic, mm -hmm. across see. the street yeah. from each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the process of looking for a place to practice, we went through Colorado, and through southern Texas, different people that I'd, we had gotten to know through our schooling. Mm-hmm. And we had a very special way. It was going to be real easy to figure out where we were going to be because we would allot so many points if it was, say, 50,000 or less. We wanted a smaller community. Uh, so many points if it had our church. So many points if the school system was good. Yeah. So on down. And after we made the circuit on borrowed money, we came back through Dallas because uh, man over there... Uh, we had known in school. Mm -hmm. and Interestingly enough, when we needed the place to stay overnight, it was Dr. Charlie Hawes. Is Dr. Charlie. Who is yeah. just... He's Dr. Gene's an uncle, isn't That's he? That's correct. Gene Zachary. Gene Zachary, yeah. 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 And he's just retiring, as I believe, as of the end of this month. Yeah. He's been almost retired, yes. hasn't he? He's just yeah. been working part-time. Part -time. Yeah, I think he brought us a bunch of books here recently. That's right. Donated them. Yes. He sure did. So we came back through Texas, and uh, a friend of his had a, an apartment whom we knew, and mm -hmm. he let us sleep on the floor. <laughs> it was a one-bedroom apartment. My goodness. And, of course, Texas really wasn't, Dallas and Fort Worth weren't for us. It was much too big a city, mm -hmm. and uh, we wanted a small town. And so we went back home. Sat around and talked for a couple of days. And neither back was, home was... Uh, back to Jane's home in Ohio. Ohio. Okay. And uh, neither one of us wanted to make up our mind. And one morning it just said, go down and see what you can find. So I mm -hmm. borrowed some more money and came <laughs> down to Texas. Uh -huh. And uh, in a period of about three weeks, put on a thousand miles and never left the Metroplex. Is that? I went to see everybody who would talk to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, there weren't as many to talk to in those were, days as there, there are now. Not, not at all. <laughs> right. Not at me, all. No. Yeah. And uh, we ended up practicing in Mesquite, mm -hmm. where we yeah. were the, the health care service at that time. Yeah. So fresh out of school, I worked at least every other night, if not every night, there'd be somebody doing something, and we did the typical chased ambulances and was a doctor for the rodeo and some for the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the jail and for the 
fire department. Laboratory in Mesquite? In Mesquite, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that the same rodeo that, uh, uh, that then as they have now, you know, they have a, a continuous rodeo performance there during right. certain seasons of the year, uh, even now it's becoming worldwide. Known, it is. World known. It's the same group, mm -hmm. some of the same people uh -huh. who at that time were our patients. I see. And I had the privilege of knowing them. And yeah. Knowing them and sewing them. <laughs> when did you When did you move from uh, Mesquite we, into close? I don't know the name of the street where I first visited you. It was close to the uh, to the Dallas Memorial Hospital. That's right. That was down on Fitchu. Fitchu. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. We moved there about three years later. The first place I went to was uh, Snyder Plaza, which is right near SMU. Practiced there for a couple years and made the friendship of a, a wonderful, wonderful woman osteopath by the name of Dr. Laura Lowell. Oh, yes. And Laura, yeah. I think, has now passed on. Yeah, she was the uh, uh, the executive director of the academy at the time I came to work for the college exactly. in 69. Exactly, yeah. Right. And also a psychologist, Dr. Erie Darnell. Uh -huh. And we formed our little group and built a little building, and yeah. that's... Yeah. That's when, where I first met you. Where we you. first met each other. Well, I know when I first met you, you <coughs> certainly uh, no inference against anybody, but uh, uh, you certainly weren't a pill pusher in those days. You were doing <laughs> a lot of manipulation. You really were. Yeah, I've always believed in that, Ray, and I think part of that goes again back to my mother who believed in a lot of natural healings just by intuition mm -hmm. because she was not a, a schooled person. Right. Uh, I mentioned at the at the beginning uh, the reference to the name uh, Dr. Sutherland, uh, of course, who was the uh, the discoverer and uh, 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 what's the other word I'm trying to search Founder. for? Found, well, well, discoverer would be the same. Developer is the developer? word I'm trying to think yeah. of. Discoverer and developer <clears throat> of the uh, cranial portion of osteopathy. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, it's. I guess the first time that uh, uh, osteopathy is introduced into the field of, of the cranial field, so mm -hmm. to speak. So uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, uh, of course, he died when, in 57 or 50? 54. 54. Uh, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about Dr. Sutherland. Now, you know, we have, and, and I'd like for you to also let me uh, uh, relate to me, if you will, the circumstances under which our archives here at TCOM became the repository of some of great deal of his collections. So if you just kind of tell the story as, as you remember it about Dr. Sutherland. Okay. Dr. Sutherland was uh, probably one of the most unique physicians that we've ever had. Mm -hmm. He was an original thinker. He was not swayed by opinion. He was a searcher for truth yeah. and a very ardent worker after truth. And the story has it, and I believe it's true, that as he was walking through one of the buildings at Kirksville one day, he saw a mounted skeleton in which all the pieces had been separated but put into their relative positions in the head. We have 29 bones in our head. 29. Including... Well, the one that fits across here, without that one, we're down to 28. Mm -hmm. And we've got three little ones in each year, so if you take those out, we're down to 22. But the other 22 make up the, the head. Mm -hmm. And he was the first one, just as still was the first one to say that the sacroiliac joints moved and had clinical significance when they didn't. Mm -hmm. Sutherland was the first to say the bones of the cranium had to move. Now, no one had ever felt this or had even uh, thought of this, had not even been hypothesized. Mm -hmm. But his rationale said when he saw this disarticulated skull and he looked at the way the bone on the side of the head fits with the bone of the, the vault or top part, and a thought came to him that they were beveled like the gills of a fish, and if so, they must have something to do with respiration. And as you might guess, this was a crazy idea because to some people it's still a crazy idea. <clears throat> but he, this thought is sometimes happens to searchers and those who eventually develop very new things like Alexander Graham Bell. Mm -hmm. uh, he, had, he had an idea, Einstein had an idea and it would not let them go. Right. Mm -hmm. So he pursued this and he took a penknife <clears throat> 
and whittled, if you will, a skull, a human skull apart, which must have taken him weeks and weeks and weeks because it's an extremely intricate mechanism. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but as he did this, he also then began to sense on other people to see if he could feel motion, and sure as luck and work would have it, he did. Uh -huh. And he found out that the cranium, not only the cranium moved, but then he went down and he said the sacrum moves. And not only that, they move in synchrony with each other. Mm. And he began to reason further based on anatomy and physiology, which is the foundation of our profession, Ray. Uh -huh. Yes, let me, I, I, I believe, uh, I believe I remember having reading something about A.T. Still, what he said about what osteopathy, that defining osteopathy, there have been lots of definitions, yeah. but he said it's anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. Is exactly, that correct? exactly. <laughs> right. And the only, if there's an evolutionary development, if you will, for osteopathy, it was when people like Core began to investigate the physiologic changes that are associated with anatomic changes. Are you talking about Dr. <laughs> Irwin, Irwin Core? Oh, yes, Dr. Core, who just, just retired. retired. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. was my professor in physiology. Oh, was he? Yes. At Kirksville? At Kirksville. Yeah, yeah. And after having quite a distinguished career there, he came here and had an even greater distinguished he career, did. if he that's did. possible. Yes. Yeah. And he still works with us. Yeah, oh, he sure does. We have a yeah. study group, and he meets with us once a month. Yeah. And we still keep looking for things. But Sutherland's persistence began to pay off, not only professionally in his practice, but with some of the profession. Mm -hmm. And the crazy idea, which the success almost says, Ray, that if, if you're going to be successful, you must be ostracized first. Semmel Weiss, who discovered childbed fever, which changed the entire course of obstetrics in the world. Mm -hmm. I understand died in a men mental institution because his profession would not listen to him and he knew he was right and it drove him mad. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. Sutherland unfortunately didn't have to go through that yeah. <clears throat> and he published some little articles and finally the, one of the uh, AOA people allowed him a part on a program. Uh, AOA, that's... American Osteopathic Association, thank you, Ray. Right. <laughs> and a few I think it was as few as five or six said there may be some truth to this and I believe George Northup's father was one of these people uh -huh. Tom mm -hmm. George Northup being the former editor of our, right. our osteopathic national journal mm -hmm. and Tom being his father mm -hmm. and Tom being the founder of the American Academy of Osteopathy, which is what it's known as now. It's the old right. Academy of Applied Osteopathy is now the American Academy of Osteopathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, there were just enough people that would listen so that he began to teach just first of all in his home. And then he went to Des Moines. Des Moines was the first place that gave him audience as a college. And Dr. Paul Kimberly, who had an extremely distinguished career as a teacher and professor as well as clinician in our profession, mm -hmm. now retired in Florida. Paul be took hold immediately and began to teach the anatomy for Dr. Sutherland. And the first course was two weeks, eight hours a day, mm -hmm. of nothing but, guess what? Anatomy, 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 anatomy and anatomy. anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. And it was after this then that the physiologic portion of the cranial field began to be worked into the teaching. Mm -hmm. And of course, in osteopathy, the total body, if you will, of osteopathy <coughs> has got to hinge on this reciprocal relationship between the two, whether it be in the head or the arm or the leg or where it is. Mm -hmm. So in this regard, as Dr. John Goodridge in a Tom Northup, which is a, an honorary lecture given each year at the Academy, mm -hmm. National Academy meeting, uh, once said probably the most unique contribution of the profession was the development of osteopathy in the cranial field. I see. So it's a, it's a momentous kind of a thing. It's still new. Mm -hmm. uh, he first presented it to the, to the profession in the very early 40s, latter part of the 30s. So 
it's roughly 50 years old, which in the field of science and medicine is very new. Mm -hmm. And we now have several hundred people who have been trained in colleges. It's become part of every college now has some phase of osteopathy in the cranial field. It may simply be a little introduction. It may be a full 40-hour course, which uh -huh. is what we believe, the, the foundation believes it takes to learn the material. Let me digress just a minute when we're talking about uh, titles and, and defining uh, names. Uh, since I've been involved with osteopathy, uh, when I first uh, uh, learned about the various departments, it was, uh, you know, OT and T and OP, P and OP P. and P and P That's and it. so yeah. forth. Now we're manipulative medicine now here at TCOM. But what is it, uh, any move on to, to uh, uh, reach a common uh, decision on the same name in all the 15 colleges of osteopathy? Not overtly. I see. Uh, partly this is due to the, the difference in the way that's taught at each of the schools. Mm -hmm. Some places it's part of the general family practice department. Some, as here, is mm -hmm. a separate department that is hopefully will pervade all other departments, not just general family practice. Well, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but now, as of from about 1980 or 81, in our curriculum, aren't we now teaching osteopathy all four years? We've got the first three. And the, but there's, it's optional in the fourth year for, as a matter of fact, even into the uh, resident years. I see. And as of just this past year, the residents do yeah. come and study with the departments on a regular basis. Now let's get back on the main track. I didn't oh, mean no. to switch you off, yeah. uh, but uh, back to Dr. Sutherland. Finish the story on him. See, we were saying that he was, we had just gone through the development of the way of teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a man and woman by the name of Lippincott from New Jersey seemed to have been taken completely with the thought, and they then devoted the rest of their lives, which were long. Yeah. Uh, they both lived to be in their 80s, as Dr. Sutherland lived yeah. to be 81. And they then developed on paper a lot of what is still used for treatment of the rest of the body utilizing what Dr. Sutherland called the primary respiratory mechanism. Mm -hmm. And just a word on that because that is, yeah. the, that is the foundation or the central unit about which osteopathy in the cranial field evolved. I see. Well, that's very important. He found that, yeah, <laughs> he found that the bones of the skull, the, the bones of the head really, all right. mm -hmm. 22, 6 or so, however you want to count them. Right. But all the bones of the cranium needed to move, and they needed to move in a fashion that was free for them, the same as an arm or a leg or anything else has a certain motion. The arm can extend and it can come back. Mm -hmm. And if it can't do all of those things, something's going to have to be compensated for. Mm -hmm. So this being one of the principles of the, of the <clears throat> osteopathy, we only have four. Uh -huh. And of those four, osteopathy in the cranial field manifests probably as much as any other method of treatment, uh, all of these principles. He then went on to say that the brain and spinal cord, as the brain uh, expands and contracts in a convoluted fashion like a ram's horn, mm -hmm. and this is evident in, in surgery, uh, and we've now had somebody who has found it on magnetic res resonance imaging has seen the movement, how subtle it is. We're talking now in terms of <coughs> movement ray at the most of maybe two millimeters. Mm -hmm. Two mm -hmm. millimeters. That's not even a sixteenth of an inch, I don't believe. Yeah. But if you get a piece of celery between two close teeth, it doesn't take much to make you miserable. That's right. And that's the, the most common way of explaining or understanding how so little can mean so much. And this is one of the phrases Sutherland used, and still, still did. Mm -hmm that it's the little things in osteopathy that mean so much. Mm -hmm. He then utilized the coverings of the, the brain and spinal cord as one element or component, the bones of the cranium, the cerebrospinal fluid, which fluctuates back and forth, not circulates this way, but just expands and contracts, right. the 
central nervous system, which tends to expand and contract, as we said, more in a ram's horn fashion. And as it expands, the spinal cord tends to raise, tends to go down when it comes internally. And then the, the attachment to the sacrum, and that's why some call it the craniosacral mechanism, or as is called for short or by nickname, and it's no more than that, is the cranial. A lot of people call it cranial osteopathy. Mm -hmm. But Sutherland did reach acceptance, and in 1953, just a year before his death, wisdom uh, seemed to dictate to him and some others, uh, especially Dr. H.I. Magoon, Sr., who was a Harvard graduate and president in Mamie Eisenhower's osteopath in Colorado. Mm -hmm a very distinguished man and a very ardent osteopathic physician, very dedicated to this concept and who authored the book, the only uh, textbook we have on osteopathy in the cranial field. Uh, so it was Dr. Magoon, Dr. Sutherland, and Dr. Handy, whose wife Ann Wales still lives and is now writing what will be the authoritative text. It'll be the reference work of Sutherland's writings. And it was through Dr. Wales who, when she was preparing to close out her practice in her home and retire. Is that Dr. Ann Wales? Dr. Ann Wales. Mm -hmm. Ann is now 85. 85. And is, uh, we've been engaged now for three years in writing this book. Yes, I want to, you to well, say a little about that. You're co-authoring the book. Uh, I serve as one of the editors. One of the editors. Yes. Well, give us a little more detail on that. What Ann has done is to, to take all of the works that were either written or spoken and then recorded by Dr. Sutherland and from people's notes. And all the major topics that have to do with osteopathy in the cranial field were then taken and, for instance, maybe there was one lecture on, let's say, the, the cranial vault, the top of the head. Maybe he did a little better job in one city than he did in another, mm -hmm. or someone added something. She took the best of all that we had, uh -huh. and she's now putting this in the book. And we're on our fourth draft, and we hope to go to have this published in the spring. And what predicated this, Ray, was that, like so many things, as the concept became more and more accepted, it went from absolutely nothing and five people, so to speak, in the early 40s, to now, it is the, the foundation, for instance, of a College of Osteopathic Medicine being proposed by five medical physicians in Paris, France. Is that right? It is that profound that mm -hmm. it actually mm -hmm. transcends some of the other uh, earlier forms of manipulation. We have many forms, at least seven, which we teach here at this college. I see. And we're very privileged to have people here who have been trained in multiple methods because it really gives osteopathy a chance to flourish and gives our graduates a much better mm -hmm. chance in, in the public as far as doing better work. Can you uh, add anything further, as I alluded to earlier, uh, our archives is a repository <laughs> of some of Dr. Southern's collections. So there anything that we've got uh, in our repository that we haven't discussed? Uh, that Not really, but we have the bulk of all that he left mm -hmm. because Dr. Wales, when I spoke with you and said, would, mm -hmm. could this college and yourself as curator, could you accept this material? Right. Uh, right. And you agreed that you would have make space for right. it. Right. And this then became a focal point. And some of the work from the Lippincotts, we have... Yeah. I'm uh, familiar with that name. Yeah. Well. They published the uh, chapter on what are called the peripheral techniques. Most people think in terms of just the head and, and sacrum, but it applies to all parts. And they published an article in one of the American Academy of Osteopathy yearbooks. Mm -hmm. And we have the original glass, if you will, slides yeah. before we had the paper slides mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. we have today. Right. The repository has these original glass slides. We have the original negatives from which the pages were printed. I just came by those within the last week, right. which you, which you right. received. Right. Uh, we have some of the memorabilia, some of the honorary cape and whatever the name is for the other part that we wear at graduation ceremonies. That, is that called a hood? 
it may be part of the hood. Yeah. But anyhow, we have that. And uh, secretly, I have, through Dr. Becker, who is retired, who was one of Dr. Sutherland's very closest friends and mm -hmm. was with him at his time of, of uh, death, right. I have his old Mersham pipe. And as soon as I find a place for that, I need to do this also. I see. But we have here the bulk of, of what he left to us through himself and through these other people. We have an uh, old diploma honorary citations, much you have a lot of those of your right. own up in your office. That's right. Yeah. Now we have the bulk of it. It came through uh, when Ann needed a place to store these things and it was fortuitous that you could make room for us here. Oh. Oh, I wanted to finish one yeah. part. Yeah, all right. Uh, the three of these men then formed the Sutherland Cranial Teaching Foundation in 53 just a year preceding his, his passing, he passed on in 54. Mm -hmm. And in the time from 53 to this day, there have been only four presidents of the Cranial you're, Teaching Foundation. So you're the fourth president? I'm the fourth. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Becker preceded me, Roland Becker, uh, who was president for 17 years. Uh, Dr. Lippincott uh, was president for a number of years, and of course, Dr. Sutherland only got to serve one year. Well, I gather from what you're telling me then that it's a very active organization rather than <clears throat> passive. Very. Uh, yeah. We have an annual course, which is one week, 40 solid hours. It's termed an introductory course, and it's offered to fully licensed physicians and dentists. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the dental textbooks now have a chapter on osteopathy in the cranial field. I didn't know that. And before they closed the college at Georgetown, uh, Dr. Vala Fryman would go there each year to present a course to the dental students. Mm -hmm. We have uh, recognition in the Cranial Journal, Cranio is the name of it, mm -hmm. uh, which is the world's leading journal for temporal mandibular joint, so-called TMJ problems and I'm privileged to serve as the editor of the osteopathic section of, of that journal, so they've recognized us. How long have you been us. doing that? I guess probably about 10 years since about it 10 started. Years. Okay. Well, <laughs> but, you, excuse me, go ahead. Oh, it just, it's so exciting, Ray, because uh, we've been going and working with the British School of Osteopathy in London, mm -hmm. uh, the former Maidstone School, the now the uh, European School of Osteopathy in Maidstone, England. Uh, we spent a considerable time working with people and taught with them several times there and here in I remember Belgium. I met, uh, I don't know just exactly what his title was, but uh, I guess it'd be equivalent to a DO, but he was from Italy that uh, came by here yes. about a year or so yes. ago. That you're, I mean, in other words, you were involved in it, and he came over and did a lot of, quite a bit of research. Right, in, and we now in have. Archives the potential for a, a very elementary, s small, as you might guess, school in Italy. Uh -huh. There's a group of DOs who want to start one there. Good. Uh, as planned, uh, is currently planned a year from this October, the October of 91. We hope to share as a faculty going to Australia. Australia. Australia has an osteopathic college now that is recognized by the government and by the accrediting groups in the academic arena. This has just come on. We've been working with them for, oh, I don't know, 10, 12 years. I see. So it's marvelous that uh, osteopathy is spreading, but it's interesting that much of it is spreading through osteopathy in the cranial field, yeah. which is uh, not the most prevalently taught or understood of the various kinds of osteopathic medicine. I see. Well, you know, now, I appreciate that general information that you're giving me. Now let's be a little more personal, a little more specific, and what uh, John Harrico's contribution has been. <laughs> now, you came for, with TCOM on a part-time basis in 74. And it didn't 75, last, January 1st. In, oh, in 75. 75. Uh, that's right, and we became a state in September 75, right. so you were with us as an independent school for nearly a year. Right. Right, and, and you started on part-time, but that didn't last long. You became uh, full-time. So you were head of the uh, OPP&P or whatever department That's we called right. it at that yeah. particular time, and left the medicine now. But uh, 
and you were chairman. I guess you were the, well, I wouldn't say you were the founding chairman, because I guess Catherine Carlson Catherine was in Carlson. there somewhere, wasn't yeah, she? she? Did, was, did you replace Catherine yes. in, in that respect? Yes. Yeah. Because she never was, although she still continued her practice here in Fort Worth. I never did see much of her, you know, well, except uh, during, you know, Back, back then, everybody came were volunteers. That, well, that's right. She, she was certainly she a volunteer. She couldn't volunteer full time. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> You're so correct. Yeah. You're so correct. Well, anyhow, then you, you became the department head and were in that capacity when you had your own near-fatal heart attack. Yeah. Thank God you didn't. And uh, that was what year? Uh, 83. 83. And then you stepped down from being the uh, department chairman uh, shortly after that, and but you still are doing full-time duties as a full professor in the department. Yes, sir. Uh, what uh, uh, observation uh, do you have uh, uh, as to the progress that has been made? Now, you know, we've had the gold statement, and we've grown from a bowling alley uh, institution to a 15-acre spread and three large multiple-story buildings and it just dedicated, not dedicated, but broke the ground for another one just yesterday or the day before. Uh, and uh, uh, the future looks very, very strong and good. Uh, what, uh, what, what do you think about where do we stand as far as we're still osteopathy, anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. Uh, but where are we in the thinking of the, the average student that becomes a D.O.? Ray, that's a, an excellent question. I wish I had an excellent answer for you. It's been a real sincere privilege to share the growth mm -hmm. of the college yeah. as you've shared right. longer than I have. Yeah. And we have grown materially. We're dealing now with students who come to us out of a very scientific background. They come from an area many times that they have never experienced osteopathy and they're coming strictly on the basis of either the philosophy, by the way, the OPP and P mm -hmm. is still my choice for the name of the department. It's Osteopathic Philosophy Principles in Practice. In practice. And mm -hmm. They're just, still use these terms. I didn't originate those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, Dr. Steele did. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, without the principles and the philosophy, of course, we have nothing. We become just another medical school. Mm -hmm. That's our uniqueness, our difference. That, as it's expressed through osteopathy in the cranial field, is probably the most unique contribution of our profession. I see. Uh, our students come because they've been very successful in... Uh, testology, they've been able to learn how to take tests, how to get through exams. Mm -hmm. The competition is very keen. Mm -hmm. The technology is so well developed that it's very difficult for most, if not many of the students, if not all of them, to make the transition from the field of logical, sequential, especially with the computers, the either or on off mm -hmm. zero one kind of uh, mindset and thought process yeah. to go back to the fact that man is not a machine he is and he isn't mm -hmm. he has many things doctor still used to refer to uh, the grand architect and the, the grand engineer because the creator did make us to operate by some of the principles of engineering and machinery. Mm -hmm. But then the thing that's still said, and I, it's not complete, but part of it is, is that after all is considered, man is a triune being. Man is body, mind, and spirit. Mm -hmm. Our students are body, mind, and spirit. But in order to get here, and because of the current trend in training, with television and mm -hmm. the ex absolutely utter explosion of data, yeah. uh, they come prepared more for what might be called traditional medicine. Mm -hmm. It's the only one. You don't have a program that features osteopaths on any television network. Uh, many have never experienced osteopathy. So the job has always been for the department to 
give them enough of the history and the philosophy and hopefully enough information and training that they will then experience for themselves what they can do for others and in some cases what can be done for them. And I feel as others do and we've not been able to accomplish this here yet that when we get a real health service osteopathic health service for our students it will make a tremendous difference for whatever reason uh, it has not been able to be accomplished as yet I think this will be a big big point I might say Ray that the truths it, truths will always prevail mm -hmm. always yeah. and the truths that are inherent in the osteopathic profession and the osteopathic concept the, the osteopathic concept by the way that is currently in the glossary of the profession mm -hmm. was developed right here at TCOM I see. in response to a need by the Air Force because we had so many osteopaths going in they formed an association yeah. and they needed a definition for who and what they were uh -huh. we have modified it the most recently just will be going into this falls glossary but for all purposes it's the same one that was developed here originally and without this concept we're ordinary we're just like everybody else uh -huh. So as we, if and how we can impress our students, and I might add our faculty. Yeah. Our faculty have come from other colleges where they did not have the privilege of either the contemporary teaching or the breadth of teaching that we offer here at TCOM. Right. Whatever it is, when the time comes, the truth of osteopathy will prevail, and I would like to see it in the United States, but Ray, it's a lot more exciting abroad mm -hmm. the uh, the medical physicians many of them are specialists and they have reached the, the ultimate in their particular specialty I'm thinking of a French oral facial surgeon who, when he heard about osteopathic medicine became so enthralled I had the privilege of being in his office last fall he has a treatment table outside his operative suite now where is he located he's in Paris in Paris and uh, sure. When the patient comes out of the operative suite, if it's to be a, an office procedure, there's a treatment table before they get to the waiting room. Mm -hmm. and every patient gets an osteopathic treatment by a medical physician. And one of our board members for the Teaching Foundation, when she opened her office for practice, on her announcement card it said, so-and-so, uh, board-eligible physiatrist, announces the opening of her office for the practice of osteopathic medicine. She had studied with Ann Wales for many years, mm -hmm. with Roland Becker. She had taken several courses with the Teaching Foundation. Uh, it's like one of our pathologists. Everyone is invited to sit in on the first lecture of osteopathy in the cranial field. Mm -hmm. And our pathologist sat in the first year. He, he's no longer with us, but a uh, wonderful man. And after the lecture, he came down and he said, you know, he said, I've been more of an osteopath than I have an allopath, which is a current term used for right. MDs. Mm -hmm. right. He said, uh, I think more like you do. And we're in a state now where there are those who are carrying MD degrees thinking like a DO and those who carry DOs thinking like, they're a, like an MD. And as... One of the goals at Kirksville many years ago, there was a decade of purpose similar to our goal statement. And uh, it's the hope that eventually the truth of osteopathy will find itself into the health care field across the board. And I think that can happen. Right? Good, good. You mentioned a moment ago about uh, uh, the growth in Europe uh, of osteopathy. Uh, reminded me of, of a mutual friend of ours who I, we've mentioned a few times in the past, Dr. Clint Burns. You oh, know, yes. When he uh, was interning down in New Orleans, you probably have heard the story of his purchasing a picture of A.T. Still yes. and his 194 pose, you know, uh, and he, he bought it from the merchant who was interested only in selling the frame. He didn't even know who the, the person was mm -hmm. in the picture. And he sold it to Clint for ten dollars, but Clint recognized who the picture was, who the picture was of Doctor Still. And of course, after he bought it, he asked the fellow if he knew who it was. And of course, he didn't. And he asked him where he got it. He said, "Well, it came from on an, uh, an assignment 
from uh, from Amsterdam. You see, so in 1904, back at that particular time, uh, at the turn of the century, actually Dr. Still wasn't he pretty well more accepted to some degree in Europe than he was in his own country? Yeah, that I really don't know. I don't, I've heard that. That's yeah. all I know. I didn't know. I mean, but an interesting thing how things will go. His first anatomist mm -hmm. was an MD professor from Scotland. Yeah, and. Within the last few years, uh, in serving on faculty at the British School mm -hmm. for Osteopathy in the Cranial Field, a man came in who is the former Dean of Medicine of the sc school in Edinburgh, Scotland. Edinburgh, Scotland. Now he came to study with us, mm -hmm. what, 100 years later? Yeah. Over, a little over 100 years later. That's correct. So those who, I, I think the expression, those who have ears will hear. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, I think, the, I think the profession is absolutely marvelous. It's uh, helped part of my reason for being here. It's raised a family on it. Well, good. If you had an opportunity to say what you'd like to be best remembered for, what would you say as far as your association with TCOM or the profession in general? I guess it would be just that I helped. That you helped. I really would be well, proud, made, of, be made proud quite of that. You made a contribution <laughs> to TCOM, that I know. Well, Can you think of anything else that we haven't touched on in our little chit chat we've had here today? You've had a great career. You've been now in practice since 50, uh, 57, 57 yeah. so that's how many years? More, uh, more than few. More than few right. <laughs> I guess the only other thing I'd like to just touch on a moment and just briefly sure. is that I guess the privilege that I now have and the school has afforded me this by allowing me academic time mm -hmm. is that the profession is about to publish the first osteopathic textbook in our history. I'm glad you mentioned that. I've this forgotten is, it. And uh, again TCOM played a part in this in that uh, J.J. Jones, who graduated here a few years ago. Yes, he's out in Pomona now. Yeah, the, he's chairman of the depart, acting chairman of the Department of Osteopathic Philosophy and Principles. Yeah, it's at Pacific College. Pacific College. Mm -hmm. Right. And about two years ago, J.J. got the idea that uh, we needed a textbook, and he wrote to the AOA and said he would do it. Mm -hmm. And then the, in part of this, he was going to use the information provided by ECOP, which is the Educational Council on Osteopathic Principles, made up of representatives of each of the 15 colleges. Mm -hmm. This didn't sit well with some who had spent nine years developing this material, plus the fact that J.J. had not been in practice perhaps as long as some felt would be well for an editor to be. Mm -hmm. But he did serve as the catalyst. And the ball was then picked up by the Department of Research of the, uh, a man by the name of Dr. Levine in the, in the Bureau of Research, because this had been part of what he believed, is that we must have a textbook. Mm -hmm. uh, it then was put out to each college, recommended somebody from their faculty to represent them. And when it was all over, Dr. Bob Ward from Michigan will be the general editor. It will have seven sections. The book will be 1,000 pages approximately a Gray's Anatomy size book. Mm -hmm. The first 500 will be divided into seven sections, one of which will be uh, the history, of course, the osteopathic right. philosophy yeah. and principles. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is really a privilege to be granted, I've been granted authorship of this section of the book. Right. And then the last 500 will be the ECOP document that we've all shared in developing over the last well, really 10 or 15 years, but deliberately the last nine. Mm -hmm. And this will be then transformed into the anatomy and physiology in practice of osteopathic medicine. Mm -hmm. And the last thing then would be the revision of the osteopathy and the cranial field textbook that Dr. Magoon edited. And uh, I'm sort of spearheading that and looking for lots of workers. Yeah. And if I'm privileged by the grace of Lord to, to do these things, Ray, yeah. then I will truly feel satisfied. You feel, <laughs> well, you certainly be remembered, no well, question about that. Just if I, that's why I said I'd like to just 
remember that maybe I did some part. Yeah. Well, Dr. John, it's been a pleasure to visit with you this afternoon, and it's been a great thrill to have seen your career uh, here in at TCOM for the last 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking a moment ago when you were talking that I've been doing this now off and on for about 10 years since I joined the mm -hmm. library and special collections and the oral history portion of that. You're my 40th and I guess final uh, <laughs> narrator. Uh, you see, mm -hmm. I'll be, I've got a countdown down, is down, down to 23 days. I'll be retiring the 1st of September. So, uh, it's been a thrill to have uh, visited with you and uh, to know you, and I look forward to seeing you as long as I can. Uh, and it's been good to have you with us this afternoon, as I stated in the beginning. I believe this is about the eighth day of August, 1990, and it's been 15 years since you came to work here. Right. I guess I would just add sort of an amen that says we've all been privileged to know you, Ray, because you've oh, been... Yeah. You're oh, you're too kind to say oh, that. You've been an inspiration to a lot of people because yeah. you've carried the banner for a long time when we didn't have all of this beautiful... We had a bowling alley. We had a bowling alley, <laughs> that's right, and a dream. And a dream. And that's you right. carried that banner, so yeah. if this is, in fact, your last attempt at this, we finish our careers together, in a sense. In a sense. And I, I give you my thanks, and I a privilege to be asked to do this, Ray, and I thank you. You're more than welcome, Dr. John. Thank you very much. <laughs>